start off. Hello everyone and welcome along to this live webinar and we are very excited. This is the first of a series of uh, webinars. We name them Ask Me Anything with uh, experienced property investors, property developers, landlords and influencers and trainers. And today I'm uh, honored to be joined by Kazi. Uh, um, the firm is Kazi, property by Kazi, yes? Uh, uh yeah. Has property by Kazi, all, all of the above. <laughs> yeah. So, pleasure Thank to you. have you here with us. Um, so, the way it goes, let me perhaps, I will share the agenda. Um, so, it's mainly about, you know, hearing about your experience. One second, I will share the screen. Um, and then we will. So, yeah, so this is the agenda. So, welcome from the landlord team. I think that I completed. Mm -hmm task then Kazi it would be great to hear about you about your experience about your investments um, and then perhaps to speak about some projects that you did and some mm -hmm. tips uh, to our audience and then we will have a session for questions and answers so for the people um, that are here live with us please feel free to ask questions on the chat but you can also raise the, your hand during the session and we will provide you with um, the ability to ask your question all right so kazi welcome good evening um Thank you for having me i will let you to introduce uh, yourself now okay amazing so firstly um it's luckily that i am a property investor rather than in tech as clearly I found my callings. I've struggled. Apologies. I respect everybody's time. So apologies for being slightly delayed today. But I'm not the best with tech, um, but we've got here in the end. So my name is Kazi or Kazim Ali Balogan. Or well, often, um, as you know, as I meet people around town, they just say, hey, you're that property guy. Um, my, my journey in property started, I think I've been saying 10 years ago for like the last couple of years. So we're probably at sort of 12 years now. Um, and I've really done everything all the way from buying my sort of first residential home to more vanilla buy to let to auction purchases, commercial to residential conversions, residential to residential conversions, uh, ground up new builds, uh, loft space developments, airspace developments. So pretty much you name it, I've done it, built a portfolio um, only in London. So I've only ever developed where, you know, where I live. Um, that was always my focus and was always really important to me. I have been able to assist a lot of people <laughs> in their journey over the last few years outside of London as well and have good contacts all over the UK. However, that is really my sweet spot. You know, when it comes to, to property investing as a whole, I think a lot of people, for, for a number of reasons, get quite scared and want to differentiate property from any other type of business. But, you know, it really has the same key components that you just have to reproduce, reintroduce, you know, as any asset class across the board. If you wanted to set up a sandwich shop, you look at the basics and say, you know, how much does it cost me to buy bread? How much does it cost me to buy butter? How much does it cost me to buy cheese? What, like, is a fair rem remuneration for my time of making them? And then is there a marketplace to sell them at a price that makes sense? And that's really the same with property. So in terms of things that I've learned across my journey, one of the number one things that I would say is, you know, price is everything. You make your money when you buy. Um, and that goes for your residential home. It goes for, a, you know, buying land or it goes for just a simple refurbishment. The purchase price is really, really important. And you need to get that right because you can afford effectively maybe to not have the best build team for it to take slightly longer than expected for the market to move in a negative direction. If you buy at the right price initially, you're able to insulate yourself from, you know, the what ifs, the maybes. The market at the moment is in a position where it's not the strongest for sales. It's definitely more of a, a buyer's market. So kind of gone are the days where anybody can be a developer or anybody can be a property investor and you can just allow the market to carry you. You really have to be making smart, sensible decisions across, you know, your portfolio and any investment opportunities, whether that be when it comes to location, the type of property, the way in which you structure your investments, how you finance them, all of these, you know, intricate details of buying property and being an investor have become, have become a lot more important. You know, in terms of a strategy, like I said, I've done 
little bits of everything across you know across my journey Kazi, can I interrupt you for a second before you go to strategies? Like uh, for my curiosity, why why you chose property as your main business? You know, when you see, remember what was the time that you said, okay, I think that in this you know area I can do good. You know, I can. So it, it was a really pivotal moment for me. My first, I've always kind of had that entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit, but my first actual business, you know, I'm very much passion led. So I think if you love what you do, it becomes, you know, five, 10 times easier because you want to get up when you have those setbacks, you know, you want to make sure that you can make it work. Um, and one of the first businesses I had was in like shisha or hookah, which basically post the smoking ban coming into place in the UK meant there was people creating these massive outdoor smoking areas. Um, and we were basically facilitating the demand for that with a new product coming into the market built from going to offer smoking, you know, the shisha, the product in just very local pubs and bars and restaurants to be in placed in some of, and actually the largest nightclubs in the UK, making really good return. It was about creating that value proposition. Um, but I tell this story because again, it's a lot of the components I learned in that business are really, you know, valuable when it comes to any business I've had post that, but effectively, so we were at other people's venues but we were always relying on them in terms of their terms, when they wanted us, when they needed us. We then said, okay, you know what? This is going really well. We went into festivals and we're doing pop-ups at festivals and eventually had the confidence to go and take a license to trade in a local premise um, and turned it around and started doing really well. The issue with that property was that the property was amazing. Location was amazing. Right next to my university, great footfall. We're doing really good business, really good numbers. But it was an old property. And because we only had a license rather than a lease, we didn't own the asset. So the landlord at any time could have given us notice effectively. So we weren't able to invest in our asset and build longer term wealth. And that was really the turning point for me that said, you know what? If I want to do anything, I want to do stuff where I have more control. And that's one of the reasons why I like property. You have control regardless. You know, I spoke about movements in the market briefly. Uh, you know, it's it's something that people are always going to need. We're always going to need food. We're always going to need shelter. We live on a very small island, uh, really, you know, highly in terms of demand, one of the most popular places to live in all of the world. When we talk about London, I think it's top five most desirable cities. Unfortunately, we're not Dubai. We're not creating new land. Apologies, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's just as as an investment vehicle, it's something that's tangible. It's something I understood and also something that I actually have a passion for and, you know, creating nice homes for people to live in. Oh, and uh, you know that you're going to do it like full time. This will be your, you know, like main so, thing. So my, I guess with, with me, any anything I do, I sort of, you know, want to go, want to go all in. So I took the funds that I was able to raise from my first business, which was approximately 80 to 90,000 pounds. And I just looked at, you know, what can I do with this money? So I did go all in. I took all of my money and I said, what can I do? And I remember having a conversation with my broker at the time, you know, but I still use this day. And I just said, look, like, this is what I want to do. And it was basically an auction purchase with a bridge in loan. And he said, this is a real, a real baptism of fire. But I said, look, I've, I've run the numbers. I, I'm confident in it. And effectively, if this works, this will be my proof of concept. And I'm going to rinse and repeat. Nice. And, uh, and so you started with, this was your first uh, purchase, like auction purchase using bridging. Yeah. Like, so the strategy was BRR or like you just wanted to flip? So, so the strategy was to flip. Um, and I think, I had a really interesting debate with a nice guy called Alfred recently um, in BRR versus flips yeah. and the benefits and the drawbacks of both strategies. I myself have always kind of been into flipping and then holding where necessary. He really focuses on BRR and both strategies have their merits and can work. But for me, I felt at the age I was at, I was in a place where I wanted to focus on wealth creation as opposed to wealth preservation. So I needed to build my working capital pot to allow me to have the money to go and reinvest. Because whilst BRR can be amazing, particularly in London, you know, it, it's very hard to find that unicorn deal where you get all of your money back out to go again. Yeah. And if you have a limited amount of capital, for me, the focus is around being able to work that money as hard as, you know, you worked for it effectively to get it in the first place. 
Yes. So, yeah, it's interesting because I think many investors basically debating if to go to um, either to just to build a buy to let, uh, you know, buy, vanilla buy to let portfolio, just in rental properties and basically, uh, you know, do the, the monthly cash flow from those properties and then also count on the property appreciation over the years. And like, you know, the the alternative is basically to to flip they are basically combine both strategy but i think that from my experience you actually need needs to know how to do it well because in drr you will need to either buy in cash or take a bridge bridging finance which is more expensive right. and you need to make sure that the exit strategy is valid and you will be able to remortgage by the end of the term at a higher value so yeah yeah i think i think it's interesting um you know for me I would say in, in all strategies and all type of investments, if I was to turn around and ask, you know, the sort of 30 people that are here today, plus watching, what do you want out of property? Do you want yields or, you know, do you want capital appreciation? So do you want cash flow or capital appreciation? Most people's answer is normally both, you know, and while both is amazing, to find something that ticks two boxes perfectly is very difficult to get it as a competitive price. Right. So my answer for the flip versus BRR is you should probably look to do both simultaneously. I, if you can, if you have a hundred K and you flip a property and you make, for example, 30, 40 K profit, and you can take that money to invest into a buy to let vehicle, albeit residential commercial, that's going to work specifically with really good yields and then have your working capital pot to go again. I think, you know, in the short term, probably trying to be able to do both is the most efficient way at growing your cash pot. Um, you also touched on bridging. And yeah. I think bridging is really interesting. And I love to talk about bridging because it's something that a lot of people just think is really scary. But really, it's just a vehicle to enable you to invest in property more effectively. And it's just a cost of doing business. Because if you have every purchase you buy, apart from, you know, where you have your first time buyer's discount, you pay stamp duty. You can't avoid it, you know, unless there's massive, you know, issues with the property. It's completely uninhabitable, has storm damage, fire damage, etc. So it's something that you just have to pay and is a cost of the overall deal. Bridging finance, very similarly, is just a cost of doing business. If you want to buy a property and don't have the cash to do it, you have to borrow it from somebody else. And as long as you understand what that cost is, you can use it to put yourself in a more advantageous position than somebody who was potentially buying on a residential mortgage or a buy to let mortgage because you can move at a faster rate you can you know you can be more favorable you can negotiate better terms so it doesn't always in your pocket cost you more um, the other side of it is with the buy to let market where it is with current rates if i was to use like a comparison point and say okay you know what um, your average buy to let mortgage in a limited company is around 5% at the moment, probably five, depending on where you are credit, for example, your loan to value around 5%. Then in terms of stress testing in London in particular, for it to work from an affordability calculator, most of them are on five year terms, which means, you know, your money is going to be tied up for a longer period of time, or you're going to have um, an early repayment charge, which again is tiered all the way from one to 5%. If we took a medium of that, and said, okay, so you've got a 5% per year, you've then got an early repayment charge of maybe 3%, you've got an arrangement fee of 2%, you're looking at 10% for the year if you had to get your money out year one, versus bridging it, you're looking at an arrangement fee of 1%, um, probably about 0.85 to 1% a month, depending on circumstance. So you may, for example, it may cost you an extra one or 2% over the course of 12 months, but then you've got a fit for purpose product that can allow you to negotiate a better price point. So I say all of that to say your understanding when it comes to utilizing financial tools most effectively, isn't that, you know, if something looks a little bit scary or a little bit unfamiliar, what you should really be doing is saying, you know, speaking to the guys at landlord and saying, look, like I want to understand more about this product for what I want to do and how can it be fit for purpose for me to basically make your money work as hard as you work to get it in the first place. Right. Yeah. And I totally agree. Um, 
and uh, for you know the audience here in this webinar, like you are all premium users, so you have benefits also to apply for bridging and mortgages through the platform. Um, I will put the links um, during the webinar, like how you can apply for bridging, how, how you can apply for mortgages. The nice thing in landlord that you can, mortgages, buy to let mortgages, you can see live rates, live products from uh, lenders, buy to let lenders based on your profile. And in terms of uh, strategies, you can use our rental analyzer, deal analyzer, and flip analyzer to assess the potential return, uh, which we always recommend to take into account all the costs associated with the purchase, uh, the finance costs, and then to take a look also for the long term to see how the property appreciation based on your prediction will impact your return, etc. So, yeah. Nice. All right, so um, so now, Kazi, uh, if you have uh, a story about the project that you did in the past that you want to share, that perhaps you know people can learn something out of it, it can yeah. be also you know something that you are not proud of or something that you are very proud of. I don't know. It's like from both we can learn, and you know yeah. my my take is you know like as, like if you want to be successful, you need to have failures. Mm -hmm in you know background because you know like this is like you learn from, a lot from mistakes that's it so yeah no definitely and i think look i think i learned you know a lot of my state mistakes really early on in terms not even in so much when it comes to property but i learned about myself at a very young age to the point that you know i was able to really understand who i am as an entrepreneur, who I am as a business person, who I am as a person. So doing business with friends too early, over trusting family, I learned that way before I got into property because as much as you might see all of these online gurus that, you know, say, oh, get into property with no money, you know, be financially free in six weeks or whatever period of time, the reality is that property is expensive. And whilst it can be really profitable, you know, because it's you're playing at a high level, mistakes can be equally expensive. And I think I, I learned really early on to understand your own risk profile, understand your own attitude towards risk. So I've kind of been more of a slow and steady attitude. I'm quite risk adverse. Whilst I did mention, obviously, I took a bridging loan and bought an auction property for my fir first project. It may not seem that way, but I'd done all of my calculations and I had a worst case scenario, best case scenario and the mediums. And I knew that I had other exit strategies outside of selling. So I felt pretty confident, you know, that we could deliver and also made sure that I instructed the right people to work alongside me, be that, you know, my solicitor, my structural engineer, my architect to be able to pull their years of experience. I'm, I'm, I'm big in sort of, you know, feedback and, um, you know, audience participation. So in the chat, feel free. I'd, I'd love to, you know, kind of let you guide this because being in the, story, in the industry for a decade plus, I've got sort of stories for days. So in terms of something, I guess we could either talk about residential conversions. So larger scale, taking a house and converting it into multiple flats. We could talk about um, one to two bed conversions. That's a really popular strategy at the moment, particularly at a more entry level point um, in terms of taking a flat and reconfiguring it to add value. Or we can talk about, you know, auction purchases and the pros and cons of maybe auctions and what to look out for. So if you are here, feel free in the chat to use it, you know, to, to let me know. There's not loads of feedback and I'll probably pick the first answer. We're going to have to, you know, for those that are, are here, Okay, let's let's have think, a look. Uh, yeah, because I think that we already I asked like the we have uh two questions, I think, that already people put on the chat. Um but yeah, as Scully said, just start to, to write your questions uh yeah. or raise your hand, and then we will give you the permission to ask your question out loud. But before I want to ask me on self-managing using Leno. So Angelo, I will give you um the 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 right to ask it uh, in a sec. Uh, Jonathan asked, uh, Gazi, will the EPC change? Yeah. If you landlords leave the market, the EPC change, like, the, like if you if you can speak about it, you know, basically, you know, like I think that there is a upcoming rule that you need to have your buy to let property at uh, some level, EPC level. So, yeah, what is your, uh, your on that? 
So look, I, I, I try and where possible to use as many resources that I have around me. So I have been speaking to some people, you know, quite high up in that space. And obviously the proposed plan was that all properties were going to require a C level or above EPC rating by 2028, I believe. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and effectively that's getting, you know, your property up to standard. In most cases, it's not actually too hard. Um, you know, it's the requirement now for conversions, for new builds at a minimum, when you're looking at like part L, part of building regulations. Um, and it goes down to, you know, having, you know, quite basic things like changing bulbs to LED light bulbs, having thermostatic valves on all radiators, you know, having, you know, decently, you know, producing boilers, potentially some type of insulation issue flat, you know, properties that you'll find that have more of an issue are either like detached homes um, or, you know, homes that are in a, a block of flats, but are potentially like or in the roof level where they have more heat expelling. Um, but I think with, with anything for me, any type of threat to the market, albeit changes in serviced accommodation, for example, and making that require potentially um, making like changes in serviced accommodation require a licenses or HMOs going into article four areas or changes in planning. Like every threat for an active property investor is really an opportunity. Um, you know, so when we when we look at anything, like if there are landlords exiting the market, it means that it's an opportunity to pick up those properties potentially at a cheaper price. And if you can become an expert in how to improve EPC ratings, you're going to be in a position to actually add more value because people are going to be leaving because they're scared. But really, your job as an entrepreneur isn't to look at why things won't work. It's for you to go and find solutions to how you know you can make them work. And, you know, being a property investor, you are an, an entrepreneur as well. So I think just taking that same ethos and that same attitude. All right. Okay. Great answer, Kazi. So um, perhaps let's people to ask the questions. Angelo, you raise your hand. Let me... But yeah, sorry, just 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 to add to that. But yeah. sorry, I forgot. In terms of the EPC ratings, the government have now backtracked on that. So effectively everything that so i got all of my properties up to a c probably spent thousands of pounds um and well we spent more than thousands of pounds for them to go and backtrack and say mm, probably not doing it anymore however it puts me in a better position when it comes to if i want to do things like serviced accommodation and energy efficiency and we're going to have you know properties inclusive of bills um the, the only thing i would say whilst they have potentially scrapped it is that speaking you know to lenders at a higher level there are going to be mortgage products coming out that actually offer more favorable rates so green mortgages effectively so right. if you've got a really good epc in terms of the whole green planning you're going to get more favorable rates going forward so if you can again be an early adopter in that and your properties are more efficient then you can benefit in a number of ways so i don't think there's any ever an issue with being ahead of the curve absolutely yeah angelo go ahead uh we have a question yeah 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 um you can hear me okay yeah right yeah, yeah. all right okay yeah um well with regard to epcs um i've only just in the past six months uh had a, a company um that specializes in upgrading properties for epc uh in liverpool and they spent about fourteen thousand pounds doing it but it was all free to me uh and it was a it was a government provided backed you know um green initiative mm. so I uh, I got I got this company to now look at my other properties to see if they can go into those and do do those as well for me. So that's what I'm doing for EPCs right now. Yeah, and I think I think it's great. I think if you can use you know government initiatives, you can use opportunities to obviously improve your properties. That's that's not your cost, then it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, there, there's a wider conversation on whether or not the focus should be on creating more affordable homes. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that would rather there be an increased supply as opposed to just improving existing stock. But again, I guess that's that's probably a wider political conversation. Yeah, I think uh, I'm a bit cynical in uh, the way these lenders are moving in. You mentioned about <clears throat> getting a better rate if you're a, a higher EPC level. But I've seen uh, lenders, I think they're some of them would use that as a stick to be able to 
add more onto your uh, lender rate uh, because you haven't reached uh, the appropriate level. And, and mm -hmm. it's just easy money for them, I think, really, to just use that as an, uh, 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 something to hide behind. Do you know what I mean? Potentially, potentially, yeah. Um, and whilst I agree, my, my, my ethos a lot of the time is I, I focus on the areas of the business or, you know, my own portfolio that I can control. And whilst I'd, I'd love to be in a position to influence the attitudes of lenders, and I'm sure we all would be, we're probably um, quite quite away from that at present. Yeah. Um. My other que I've got a few other questions, but they're not really aimed at you. They're they're aimed at the the landlord uh, product. So I'll leave that to the end of the uh, the, the discussions, if that's all right. No uh, problem. Thanks, thanks for Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Val. Uh... We just give gave you the permission to speak so if you can. Val Roberts. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um I um I raised my hand by accident. I had sent something in the chat. Um I'm oh, new right. to property um uh, development and it seems to me looking at the range of things available that auction uh, seems to pr provide the best uh benefits. But because um, I'm new to the area, I don't have a whole load to invest. I'm quite nervous about taking the first step. So I was just wanting any advice that you might have, any lessons that you've learned in your in your journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so au auctions is at probably over the last sort of 12 months has been where I've, I've kind of focused, um, you know, and it's, can be a bit of a minefield, but where possible, I'm going to sort of help you to try and navigate that today. Um, as a starting point, you know, to kind of go through the basic premise of auctions, you, you are liable for buying that property once you win the bid. So as soon as, you know, the, the gavel drops and you win or the, you know, you win the online bid, effectively you have to at that point pay your 10% deposit uh, to exchange. And then generally speaking, you have 28 days from there to complete on the property. So because of that, you know, you need to get all of your ducks in a row beforehand and, you know, be fully confident that you can proceed with that property. So, you know, you generally have the guide price at auction and with a guide price, the reserve, which is the minimum amount they can sell that property for, can't be more or less than 10% above the guide. So you have a rough idea of what, you know, the reserve is. But all that being said, it you know, the guide prices can be used as an advertising tool effectively. Sometimes it can be quite high and sometimes it can be really low because low hanging through attracts more people. More people means you bid each other up and they could potentially, you know, get more money than if it was advertised at a higher price point. So I'd say whilst, you know, guides are a good indicative number of what the reserve is, they don't actually represent what the true market value of the property is and what it can potentially sell for. Um, so we have this sort of process in property that we call, you know, reverse engineering the deal and how you determine what your maximum bid should be. So you start with your comparables. I know Landlord has an option to be able to show you kind of comparables for properties. Um, so you start with, you know, looking at what you think the property is going to be worth at the end, most commonly called your GDV, uh, gross development value. So you look at what the property is going to be worth based on comparing it to like for like property. So what's the condition likely to be? What type of property is it going to be? Is it purpose built? Is it ex council? Is it, you know, a period property? Is it, a, you know, it, all different types? You then would look at the size. So price per square meter or square foot, depending on your preference overall finish, then amenity space, things like gardens, driveways, etc. Um, and then just sort of overall finish. So that would give you an idea of what you think the property is going to be worth. You would then take into account the amount of money you would have to spend to get it from its current position into that position. So your cost of the works, you then take into account your purchase price, which are your purchase costs, which would be your stamp duty, um, which would be potentially your auction fees and any other legal costs involved in purchasing the property. Um, and then you would take into account what you would believe would be a reasonable profit for you. You take all of those away from your GDV, and that should give you your maximum bid effectively. Once you sort of got that, you can take that to, you know, to landlords, 
and be able to have a conversation and be like, look, indicatively, this is a property I'm looking to buy for this amount of money. Um, this is what I think it's going to be worth at the end. This is kind of what I'll be doing. And they would sort of let you know which lenders will be happy to lend. When looking at finance in advance, you need to make sure it's not all about who's the cheapest. It's about fit for purpose. Um, so which lender is going to be able to get the deal done in the 28 days that you have from exchange to completion? Um, you know, make sure that, that they do tick all of the boxes in that regards. Um, in, in terms of the type of properties that go to auction, there's sort of different characterizations that generally come with a different level of risk. Um, so you've got effectively duress sellers that maybe are people that for whatever reason, they've maybe come to the end of their own development finance. Maybe they just need to dispose of it because it was something that was inherited and they've got a tax liability or they, you know, um, a separation, all sorts of different reasons that somebody may be taking a property to auction, but effectively they need to sell it quickly and can't sell through the most conventional methods. You've then got um, institutional sellers and they generally are the safer bet in the institutional sellers such as housing associations, governments have to dispose of properties transparently for the highest price. So auctions meet, you know, those requirements. And then you've got people that are maybe selling properties of issues. So that could be issues like structural issues, issues on title, all different types of things. And, you know, it, you, you kind of need to be able to identify where those issues are. A lot of them will be you can identify them within the legal pack so you can pay a solicitor to do an independent legal pack review ahead of going you know ahead of going ahead of any purchase or potential bid um but there would be you know a cost a cost for that but it's super important i think as it's a great point i think that the issues that have you know you know might hide uh in an auction purchase uh so yeah so you have the legal pack you have the right to review the legal pack uh you can also um Take it to a solicitor. It will cost, I think, a few hundred pounds, or like, or some ish, or to review it. Yeah, no, normally like five hundred. But if you're successful, they'll normally deduct that from the cost of your conveyance since they've already done a lot of work for you. Yeah, yeah. But it's worth checking those, like the the legal pack. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I think you know, as a starting point, I wouldn't advise anybody that's not familiar with them to try and just read legal packs off the bat and not use a solicitor. However, I would recommend you start using them to get familiar with things to look out for. So a lot of the things to look out for would generally be in the special conditions and their conditions that um, are not standard auction conditions. Yeah. Well, do you use the, uh, Kazi, you use the solicitor to review legal packs or you would, you have the experience now to? I, unless, unless there's something that I'm just, not familiar with um but uh, yes and no but if, if for example i said it's a housing association disposal then probably not because the terms are standard however there are a lot of things to look out for when we talk about stories yeah. so in the league packs it's not always what's there that you should be worried about it's what's missing so for example if say everything's there but the local authority search isn't there then you may sort of be a red flag that okay is there some type of enforcement notice on the property? Does it have the correct planning? Because why would it just not, why would it be omitted? So I would definitely say as, as a guide, look through what's not there as opposed to what's there. And also just when I say get familiar with reading the terms, you know, there's some people that are, for want of a, a better word, quite unscrupulous when it comes to auctions in that they would, for example, say, you know, as part of buying the property, you're going to pay a 500 pounds buyer's premium which may be written in numbers. In somewhere in that long paragraph, it will also say, you've also got to pay a 3% plus VAT buyer's premium that will be written in words. And if you're buying somewhere for half a million pounds, straight away, you know, that's that's adding on a massive amount of money to your total costs. So I think you, you've got to be aware of that. Also, when it comes to auctions, at some auction houses, much as 50% of properties are properties that are now being traded um and when a property is being traded you'll see a clause in the special conditions basically around the seller may not be the registered owner of the property and you know you'll know from experience that a lot of lenders don't like that 
they want the person they're sending the money to to be the registered person and have their you know tr1 all, all ready to sign over the transfer deeds so it's just really about understanding those types of nuances and i think you know one of the reasons why i started why i moved from just doing property in my own name or just buying myself and then coming onto the social media space and having more conversations around buying property and you know some of the details was because I always thought look what would I have wanted at an earlier stage and how could I help to kind of provide that to people you know with, with obviously the community that I've now built yeah all right thanks Kazi Kazi in the mint if you like uh, will I let the, um, the next one to ask uh, if you can put your uh, YouTube channel or Instagram like any like uh, you know contact that you provide that people can uh, yeah, yeah. you know uh, so, uh, yeah so yeah guys feel free to follow uh, uh kazi on social media it's great content uh real use cases uh we are sponsoring uh the tours that kazi is doing um so yeah so just um yeah so uh, so yeah sorry so i was trying to get the link started talking um but yeah so that's the youtube and the instagram um if you're interested you can definitely you know definitely check that out we do a load of development tours which means you go around so off the back of you know building up quite a large following on instagram um have now got like a sort of community that i run of 80 members i think when we did like the recent numbers they currently got like about eight no, 50 million collectively in the pipeline. And we go to a lot of my members projects as well as my own and other people within, you know, my wider network, just to give you an insight on the type of deals people are doing. And it may be a slightly tougher market, how people are effectively still making things work. All right. We have another question. I can't see, there is a bug, so I can't see the name. So if you can just say your name first and then ask, please. Hi, my name's Kyla. Hi, Kyla. Hi, Kyla. Um, Thank you both for um, holding us today. I've got a question on multiple apartment um, mm -hmm. conversions. If you're looking for properties, what would your advice be on the type of property that you would look to convert into apartments? Yeah, um, I can. Let me just grab something actually for you. Just bear with me. I can, I can answer your question, but potentially, uh, would I be able to yeah. share my stuff? Is that possible? Let me see one second. Try now. Yeah. Can you see the share screen uh, button? I'm just going in now. Give me a second. I'm just getting the, the file up first. I should check if I was able to do Kazi, it. People I'm... ask, like, say that they don't they don't see Kazi in, in Kazi's info. Where, like, like on where? I put it in the. I put it in the, the chat, but I, I can't see everybody's questions. I'm not sure if there's two. Ah, separate... Kazi, you put yeah 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 Kazi, you put it uh, to you wrote it to host and panelists. Can you? Oh okay okay. My apologies. Bear with me. To everyone. Yeah. Okay okay. I'll do that now. Give me a second, and then I'm gonna go over. I'm gonna skim through. This isn't necessarily a presentation that I prefer specifically for today. However. Um, so that's YouTube. No, I did the same one. Sorry. Not I will go. Let me see. All right. Uh, I I can copy the Instagram one. Copy so Instagram. Copy right? the screen for in the meantime. Bear with me. Uh, let me see if I'm able to share my screen. Yeah. Uh, okay, could you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is an example of a one to end up being one to four bed conversion. Let's see in terms of navigating. So this was a long time ago, almost nine years ago, actually, which is which is crazy in terms of timeline. But this was a strategy I've used for, for a long time. Um, so effectively, in terms of the types of properties you need to look for, number one, and probably most important, um, is you want to convert properties that are above 130 square meters in their existing state. So that's pre any extensions, pre loft conversions, you know, that's the ideal in terms of meeting the national planning standards um, for something that's going to be fit for conversion. 
Um, it's going to move borough to borough in terms of what you need in regards to amenity space. For example, Croydon, when I did this development, was happy for you to have side access to a communal garden. They've now moved to wanting everybody to have direct access to outside space, which means balconies or um, you know split rear gardens different boroughs have different requirements so whilst there are national planning standards you're really going to have to go into the the, the nitty-gritty with your local area and which is one reason why i kind of firmly believe and if you are going to embark on a specific strategy try and focus quite geographically at least to start to give you the confidence that you know you can do deal appraisal a lot more efficiently so this property i'll kind of skim through this but was purchased in 2015 um, as a semi-detached home again we weren't actually a cash buyer however you know because we were able to get a bridging facility we were able to act as such and we we're able to negotiate fifty thousand pounds off the purchase price so it had been the same family for 40 years um, but it become sort of quite run down so why did we look at this property price location features and it also have multiple exit strategies um, and I again, I mentioned sort of early on being quite risk adverse. So the multiple exit strategies meant as a worst case scenario, plan A, we could refurbish it as a family home. If, you know, if planning got rejected, option two was to go for two flats uh, without any extensions, which would be a one bed, sorry, one, two bed and one, three bed. Then we had C and D, which was sort of more ostentatious going for three flats and then four flats. So initially... These were the plans in terms of it was supposed to be 12 months. These are our timelines in terms of complete two, two to three months in planning, six months of building works, three months of legal and sales and uh, repay the investor we were initially working with. This was effectively the structure of the deal. Um, so again, this is based on option C. So going for three flats. Um, plan wise, this is the existing ground floor flat um, that affects it. So this is the existing ground floor of the house um, that would be converted into a three bedroom flat. When you're converting three bedroom flat, three bedroom houses, as opposed to four, there's a requirement to retain a family dwelling. So if you were converting a house that was 130 square meters, but it was a three bedroom, three bedroom house, you would be required to retain a family unit, which would mean you would need, need at least one three bedroom property in there. Um, there's also now changes, which mean you need an also amount, an equal amount of waiting in terms of the number of one, two, three bedroom flats across the property. So all of these things, again, they're important to know, but also you can kind of get into reading the boring parts of planning requirements. On the um, second floor would be flat two, open plan kitchen, living room, bathroom, small study slash third bedroom, if you want to use it as that, and then two good sized bedrooms to the rear. And then the loft uh, flat, which is an open plan kitchen, living room, um, and then a bedroom, second bedroom is sort of a smaller area, so would have been used as a two bed as well. Um, in terms of site planning, this is again important that you need space for the amenities to make it work. So you need to always be able to outline, you know, what sort of bin storage you're going to use. A lot of the time you have to have bike storage facilities and general facilities as well as parking. Um, you know, if you don't have an option for parking because of the type of property, there are ways to get around this in that you can apply for potential bike storage on the road if there's maybe parking permit options but again you have to do things like day and night surveys when it comes to parking to show whether or not there is actually enough parking present you can also look at things like a p-tail survey which is effectively how close you are to transport links which would give you an idea of whether or not you could get a parking list development um, so again this is plans versus reality and i think this is this is quite interesting when it comes to property there's the famous saying from Mike Tyson that everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face when it comes to boxing. In property, I think it's more a case of everybody's got a plan until you get into planning. And planning that you hope is going to take two months, I think, in, in this case, actually for um, what we went for, our overall planning took 12 months. However, we were able to scale the development up from the three flats 
the four flats, which massively increased our GDP. So the whole project took approximately two years rather than the 12 months initially estimated. Um, we converted the ground floor flat with a rear extension, which started from here to allow us to have two one bedroom flats. So open plan kitchen, living room, um, bathroom and yeah, sorry, bathroom, bedroom. And then this one bathroom followed by open plan kitchen, living room and bedroom. Um, slight changes. If you were to put these plans in now, they probably wouldn't get accepted because this flat here isn't dual aspect, which means you only have one like sort of light flow into the property. But again, that's sort of, I guess, understanding the intricacies of planning and changes going forward. Um, you know, despite, you know, some delays, really good project. Um, yeah, sort of some after pictures. I think these, these numbers are slightly off because, oh no, they're right, sorry, actually. Yeah, so I ended up making around 400,000 pounds, you know, in terms of how, how the project went overall, cost of finance went up, but because we really managed to push the GV up, GDV up, it was still a really successful project. Um, in terms of key lessons learned were planning timeframes, like I've touched on earlier on, additional work, changes in plans are not always a bad thing. And that's something I'd like to reiterate that, you know, when it comes to business, it, you don't always have to, you know, sort of die on a hill of, I thought I was going to do this. So regardless of what happens, this is what I'm going to do. You have to be quite dynamic when it comes to business and properties included in that. So looking at how you can pivot and if there's a more successful, more profitable option, don't be, you know, too hard headed to listen to your team, listen to your build team, listen to your architects, listen to your brokers, listen to all the professionals you have around you and get, you know, as much information as possible. Other things, again, if anybody wants to speak to me at any point, I can go into more detail, but definitely services, working with neighbours, like so stakeholders, finance costs and TFL permits. But one of the good things, um, you know, you asked me to mention a fun story. So this building now is called 313 Addiscombe Road. Still looks really nice. Feel free to fact check me. You can go and look it up. You can uh, Google Maps it full addresses there. I'm not one of these developers that, you know, says all this nice stuff on social media and it doesn't actually do anything. But flats, wonderful Khadija house. Um, named it after my late grandmother, which I think is, is something really amazing to do to be able to, like, you know, immortalize those that we care about. And now my young daughter, um, her name's Khadija as well. So she's got she's got a building named after her that we still have, you know, in our name, which is which is great. Um, again, here's my social handles for those who weren't able to take it down earlier. And again, I'd, I'd probably like at this point to maybe invite any questions in regards to that project. Yeah, nice, nice. This is this was a nice story, man. Nice Thank project. Uh, I think that uh, the the nice thing is that you learned, you know, for even you know with the delays, you were able to you know to take the advantage, like to to increase the GDP, but that mm -hmm. basically to compensate. I think the the, the finance costs that were increased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Yeah. All right. Um, Yes, so can you convert houses to flats with permitted development now? No, so no, you can't. So there has been talks again on potentially allowing conversions from a house into two flats under PD. I don't see this happening, if I'm honest with you. It's not something that I would... It's not something I would hand my hat on and saying I'm going to buy places on the basis that the government have been talking about this. Um, I think it was, I can't, I can't think it was, if it was Labour or Conservatives, but we may, you've got to remember we're in election season. People are saying things for vote gandering. They were talking about making, you know, massive amounts of changes in the Leaseholder Reform Act. There's been some U-turns on that as well. And I think that was a lot more likely. I think if that doesn't happen, I would be questioning whether or not, you know, they are going to make those changes. Reason being is we really have more of a supply of, you know, flats than we do family homes. And I think making the ability to convert homes into, you know, smaller houses into two flats is really going to affect the supply when it comes to family dwellings. So I don't think that's something that's going to happen anytime soon. However, you know, it, it could be, it's been talked about, but if you were to ask my opinion on it, I think it's unlikely. And another question regarding the project, how did you explain the delay to your investor? 
Um, so the delay to my investor, you know, was explained very early on in that we went in. So j just to go back to those time frames, we went in for planning and got planning probably in month six. Um, but because we knew we'd had early we with our planning, we had something called a pre-planning where you go in and you basically get an indication of how likely you are to get planning. They don't give you any guarantee. However, they're going to tell you, um, you know, your likelihood for the scheme to go ahead, which at three units was already really successful. Um, so we had started works during that phase and we could have delivered the scheme in under 12 months for um, at three units. Um but effectively just had a conversation with the investor and said, look, this is where we are. What are your plans for your money? Obviously, if they needed it back sooner, we could have either looked to trade out the investor as we'd already massively increased the GDV of the site. And we put in, you know, well, I put in a lot of my own money to complete the project. However, if they didn't want to and we weren't able to do that with the investor, then, you know, we could have just completed it at three units they would have kind of made obviously a lot less money as well because of time frame. So it was a win-win for both parties. But I'd say it's always about having those open and honest conversations and being transparent. I think too often people bury their head in the sand when there's issues and then just pop up on day that they're supposed to pay somebody back and say, oh, it didn't go to plan. But, you know, if we were having those sort of conversations saying, look, I know we talk, talk speaking about 12 months. Um, how would you feel if the project went on for longer as long as you were effectively remunerated? And having those projects at four months, we were never concerned with the investor and still work with them to date. Sounds good. Um, so, guys, if you have last few questions, just put them on the chat. In the meantime, I will answer several, some of you asked about landlord roadmap and uh, also for a demo so i put the links on the chat just scroll up and you can see the link to schedule also a demo call with our team in terms of the roadmap we have uh, like so many items we still want to develop and continue to enhance the platform but we are really open to hear your feedback so just put it on the chat on the app um and Let's see, I think that, yeah, we are actually almost done in terms of time. Let's see, does anyone know how easy it is to gain planning on creating another dwelling, a large garden? Kazi, perhaps you can take like this last question if you have time, but. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, rear garden developments. I've I've done rear garden developments. They're not the easiest because you have, you think you're contending with Firstly, you need access. A lot of the time they want to have car access for emergency vehicles. Um, also, you have to think about overlooking blocking of natural light. So if you've got quite a densely populated area, I, you're backing onto a number of gardens, you're potentially going to find it quite difficult. Um, if, however, you're maybe backing onto a railway, for example, and you've got you know, quite large garden. So it's all about the space. If you're not sure, um, again, I can connect people, you know, if, if you reach out to me with local um, planning consultants, architects who will do a feasibility study for you or a block plan, and they can look at it, they can do some overlays and say, look, how realistic is, is your, is your idea? Because the thing with good art, like a bad architect may be able to draw you the most amazing pretty pictures, CGI's, Everything looks great with no chance of getting planning. A good architect is going to tell you, great idea, has no delivery opportunity. And it's going to save you from wasting time and money. So I think the value of the people you have around you is going to drastically affect how efficient you can be as a property investor. All right. Um... Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Do you do mentoring? Because someone, Elizabeth asks, um, so it's, it's, yeah, I don't, my, my thing is that I feel like I'm still learning myself. Like, although I've been in this for a long time, I actively feel like, you know, I'm, I'm always learning. I'm always trying to do more bigger and better projects, you know, lo loads more. So whilst I mentor a few people at kind of, which I guess would probably be like high ticket mentoring, um, I don't have the time to do sort of full-time mentoring. So I have, I only ever mentor five people at once. I'm currently mentoring three, but it's more of a, 
application process. If someone's going to pay me for mentoring, I need to make sure that it's going to be really fit for purpose and it's going to be mutually beneficial. The thing that I think would probably be more helpful for some people, am I, am I okay to mention a community here? Aaron? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, no, we want to double check. Yeah. Um, it, so within like my Instagram bio, or if you want it, I'm sure I can get um, you to send out the details later on. But we have what's called the PBK community. So on starting out, I thought, look, what would I have wanted starting out? And it's really that sounding board to help you take your investment steps with more confidence. So I have like a paid WhatsApp community. Uh, we currently have 80 members. So within, I'm in there also is my structural engineer, my architect, my accountant, um, my QS, my... Uh, who else is in there? My solicitor and a host of other people that are really beneficial. So if you've got questions in specific areas, you've got a sounding board and then you've got a tried and tested team of people around you. Um, we run regular sessions. We do site visits. We do Q&As. So all these sorts of valuable things that are going to help you become a more efficient property um, investor. We also, you know, my, my thing around the education space and why I actually came into the social media is very much a case of, you know, I, I felt there was, well, not I felt, there is an underrepresentation in, you know, black and ethnic minorities when it comes to property investment. So to show showcase more people, you know, that are actively out there doing it. Um, but it's not just a case of I just want to try and make, you know, as much money as possible. So we invite people into the group in cohorts. So we're currently just had our one year anniversary. Every three months, so every three months, we invite another 20 people to join, which is why we're at 80 members. We're having our next group of members are able to join at the end of May. So if you are interested in that, um, in my bio on Instagram, or I can also get a link for it here, if you bear with me, is a link to like my mailer list. And if you are interested in joining that, you just join the mailer list and then you'll get first refusal or I'll, I'll send the details over at a later date and you can always, you can share it with everyone. But effectively that's that's probably what for most people I find, you know, more more beneficial. Hopefully that answers your question. Sounds very valuable group. So yeah. Um, so how, so yeah, I missed that. If people want to join this group, they you can provide some detail or like join the Instagram channel. Yeah, so bear with me. So um, as, as you can tell, I'm great at answering questions in relation to property. I'm terrible at answering any questions that are sort of tech-ish related. So yeah. bear with me for one second. Um, but hopefully that's a good sign. Mm. Okay, yeah, so, so that's the link. That's the link to my mailing list. As I said, we're not accepting new members at the moment, but if you join that mailing list, you will get sent out an email as soon as we are and then there'll be full information on price point you know what it offers and you basically get first refusal and I think last time we went live of the 20 slots we sold out you know 15 straight away from the mailing list before we went on general sale um, and it's worked really well like I said we've got people our youngest member is 19 and just bought his first buy to let property um, which is you know um, you'll know in terms of sort of getting a buy to let mortgage under the age of 21 is very difficult. So sort of hats off to him and then got all sorts of different people. Some looking for their first deal, some that are more serial investors that just want to be surrounded by more like-minded people. So it's a really nice, um, quite close-knit group. And, it, you know, it, it's worked quite well over the, the year that we've been running. All right. Okay, good stuff. Uh, so yeah, I think we can uh, finish here. So if you have more questions about Landlord, you can also uh, use the chat uh, when you use the app and uh, or schedule a demo with the link I shared above. Uh, thank you very much, Kazi, for your time. Um, you are the first one in this series for premium users only. Ask me anything. And hopefully we can have another session the next uh, upcoming month, hopefully. And, uh, and I think you said, did you say... Um... Better conversation. I think you said you were going to onboard me. So if anybody, if I couldn't cover anything, I know like a lot of the stuff we really touched on it as a surface level. Um, but I think you said you were going to onboard me so people could potentially book one to ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. On our experts uh, panel, definitely. Yes. So yeah, we'll make sure it happens, and then people can basically approach you through this, uh, you know, area in the site. So basically, it's like in scheduled one-on-one -on -one calls. That would be great. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, and I hope you enjoyed uh, using the platform. 
and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thanks, Kazi. Thanks, okay. guys. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Take care. Bye. Great night. Bye-bye.